me in Chichester in 2012. Chichester, England, the home of the best of the Roman villas. Now, this video is about what actually happened in the late Roman Empire. What happened? And the contention of this video essay, this essay, essay, that's what an essay is, an essay, an analysis, is that Roman Britain destroyed itself and the Romans sabotaged it and let the Germans in and the Slavs as well, I think. And, and it obliterated itself because of too much tyranny, too much government control, which caused inflation, price controls, wage controls. They were telling people what jobs they could have, what jobs they couldn't have. None of this happened in the early empire. The early empire was, you know, as free market as could be. Uh, not, not, not entirely. Egypt was a feudal state owned by the emperor, and he used the grain to just give to the people in Rome to give uh, to give him popularity. But the rest of it was pretty free. You could travel around. Not Egypt. Not Egypt. Now, what happened was a kind of Sovietization. And I, I don't exaggerate when I say that. I really mean it. It was a kind of war communism which took over. And... Uh, there was too much control, and eventually everyone hid their money away. They stopped making good statues because they, they lacked the talent to make them. And this explains everything, and this is not being taught. Because it undermines so much of the social fabric of, of the 20th century, the post-war post world. And that's why it wasn't taught in universities. You will only find one or two papers on this online. This is why the Roman Empire collapsed. It could not afford anything by the end. So let's get into this analysis. So I, I started this quest back in 2012 when I thought, okay, something something's not right when I went to Chichester. Something's wrong here. This isn't right. This isn't right. And uh, my senses were activated by uh, when I saw these walls around Roman Chichester. And I saw that these walls were not built in the early centuries. Chichester was a, a Roman city in Britain, in southern England, and these walls were built in 350 AD. There were no walls, it seems, before that, and they're still standing. They're built quite well. They seem to have been, been made out of the medieval-type stone, but also the uh, the Roman brick. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, but why didn't they need to build them before? Why not? Was Rome so much stronger before? Why did Rome get weak? Why did they collapse? Why did they need to build these walls? Well, for starters, we know that they... They were not allowed to, to raise a militia or an army, so they maybe they were allowed to build walls. That was the only defence they had, because the emperor feared civil war. Fortifying the town, 350 AD, and you'll, you'll start to see why my all my senses were activated uh, when I saw this. Um, there's even little Roman tiles on the turrets, how cute. 60 bastions. Uh, there, there was a ballistae crossbows capable of firing metal bolts up to 500 meters. The intention was to show the enemy that this was a town prepared to fight. Okay, all right. <clears throat> yep. So Chichester is founded and then they build the city wall. Then that's when Diocletian's reforms began. That's when they built it. So Diocletian. He not only persecuted the Christians like crazy, he's called a tyrant in the British the British history, but he also, he was the last one to persecute the Christians after him Constantine made Rome Christian, but he also brought in the most tyrannical set of laws extended by Constantine that you've ever heard of, that you've ever heard of. Sons had to follow the, the path, the career path of their fathers. All wages were controlled. All prices were controlled. There were there are lists of every item and, and what you must pay for it. And what happened is that Britain, the British cities shut down in response to this. <laughs> they they literally shut down. Their trade shut down. I'm not it's not me saying that. It's uh, looks like they've been rebuilt, doesn't it? This out of earlier ruins. Interesting. Maybe ruined during the Civil War and then rebuilt. So there we go. <clears throat> and it had a very grand name, Novio Magus Regionum, or Reg, Rex, the city of the, of the king, the uh, the great city. It almost says the great city of the king, doesn't it, in uh, in Latin. Novio Magus Regionum, Regionorum, Regionorum. Uh, and that's because it has the best Roman palace. And this is where my senses started getting activated. So you walk around Chichester, beautiful town, beautiful, like all of England, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, there's the walls, yes, very nice. Yep, very good. Lovely, love. And um, 
Wow, so interesting, so interesting indeed. Yes, so so nice. Um, wow, gargoyles, walls, more walls, Chichester, and it's surrounded by walls. These people were terrified. They were absolutely uh, terrified. The walls are enormous. They, look how tall they are. This is outside the city. And there's not many Roman towns you can still, <laughs> towns in Britain, you can still see city walls. It's, it's, it, that's why I really love this town. And then, then you walk out of the town, and here I am at the villa. I've, okay, I've reached the villa. I've walked out of the town. I've reached the Roman villa of Fishbourne Roman Palace. I believe this was for the Roman governor, but people have said it might be for one of the British kings. But I reckon it's because it's the best one in Britain. It must have been for the governor. And this is a, and and the thing is, that's me in armor. And the thing about this is, yeah, yeah, don't mess with Charles. The thing about this is, it's out in the middle of the countryside, on its own. There's no wall around it. There's no wall around it. And this was built, you know. It was completed around 70, they reckon, or earlier. This was basically to show off to the Britons, I believe. Oh, look, we the Romans are now in charge. This is our the palace for our governor. I reckon it was the palace for the governor. And there's no wall. Romans didn't need a wall. <clears throat> it's all good. Yep, it's all good. The Roman road to Chichester one mile away. Yep, there's no wall around this. They don't need a wall. The Romans are strong. The Romans are powerful. Why? And my senses were activated, and I thought, this can't be right. How could such a strong, powerful state degenerate so much? And the answer is, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, um, the early dynasty of the empire, which conquered Britain, they, um, they had a relaxed attitude. Augustus brought in a kind of poll tax. There was a, a graduated tax, but Augustus changed it to a poll tax, where above a certain rate, you pay your rates, that's it. Anything you make after that, no tax. And the poll tax wasn't that much if you had money. Well, it really wasn't that much at all. So there were people in Rome who had indescribable wealth because they were allowed, they were permitted to get wealthy. Just as happened in China when we went from Mao to, um, uh, to Deng Xiaoping. And people were permitted to get wealthy. And look what happened to China. They went from bicycles to uh, building our cars and computers for us. Their cars are taking over Australia. It's incredible. And um, their, their economy really grew. And the reverse happened with Rome. Their economy seems to have collapsed. Now, not only did the, uh, there might have been less sunspots, so less crop, but their economy collapsed. By the 3rd, 4th century, there wasn't an economy. Their economy was feudalism, you know. And uh, so let's get into it. Trade with the Fishbourne Palace. Some iron Roman keys. They look glorious. Just amazing. Mortis uh, and hinge bronze keys. Wow. <laughs> Look at these keys. Right angled keys. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Wow. Uh, a Roman Roman dining. So I don't believe they were lying down while they were eating. I think probably they were lying down when they were drunk and they were sitting up when they were eating. Contrary to what the archaeologists claim. They always claim. Have you noticed? They always claim the weirdest stuff. The weirdest stuff. Iron water pipe collar. Yep, this was a this was a you know <laughs> this was for the uh, for the for the water supply. These were advanced people. There's a, a smiling dog, right? The sun. Yep. Floor plans. Oh my god, this was a huge palace. So here, I'd love if they rebuilt these with the actual pillars. That would be amazing. This is what this is a central garden. It would have been surrounded by other buildings. But there's no there's no. No, there's no wall. It's just not protected. Uh, why? Because because Rome was rich. They could pay whatever they wanted to pay. They could do whatever they wanted to do. They were rich. And later they became so tyrannical, so, such an absolute despotism that no one had any money left. No one could pay. And therefore the government couldn't pay. Some Roman, uh, some Roman uh, fruit, quinces, whatever quinces. I've got no idea. It looks like an apple to me. This is what the Romans were growing. A wine was made from medlar. I'm going to have to check what... I'm going to write down what medlar is. I'm going to make a wine from it. I want to make some wine from this stuff. Uh, perry, whatever that is. Apples were... Romans dried apples for winter use. Sacred to Apollo, the bay. Symbol of victory. 
winter savory, hyssop, purified temples. So there's a Roman garden here as well, just amazing. Just absolutely incredible. Chinese lanterns. Yep, I'm looking very, very serious. I'm very happy to be there. House leek. Wow. Christmas rose. Comfrey. Look, it just goes on. Look, hey, I get the picture. Okay, enough already. It goes on. Uh, a very Roman looking person with uh, the uh, the Roman nose happening there. Yep. The myrtle. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, this is a, a mosaic in the, basically the entry hall in the dining room had a mosaic to show off to the, uh, to the guests. To show off that, oh, this person's got some money. Uh, basically like having an iPhone today or a swimming pool in your backyard, they had a mosaic. They also attached churches um, for the workers, probably for the workers by the third century, because there was a separate outside entrance. So the way we build swimming pools on our houses today, by the third, fourth centuries, they were, fourth century, they were attaching, they extended like an, and attached a church to the villa and the villas became powerful and the cities died out in Roman Britain. They died out. There was no trade. Money was worthless. Just amazing. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, beautiful swastika. Love swastikas. Yep, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, look at that. Is that a is that a horse or a fish? What the hell is going on there? No. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Wow. Sunbursts. Wow. Um, circles. Hmm. It's almost like sun dogs, multiple suns or something in the sky or victories and Apollo and gods and hmm. Okay, so let's continue. Fishbourne Palace, as it may have appeared. And now I go to do that. Yes, done it. So, uh, Thomas Cole, the course of empire. And it seems this is inevitable. This will happen to every empire. No empire survives no matter how much they like it because the people who inherit the empire are not the people who built the empire. They lack the knowledge of the builders. It's as simple as that. The Arcadian or pastoral state consummation of empire so the builders have achieved the empire and what is left what is left to do when it's built what is left to do i'll tell you the next step is to destroy all right that's the next step so we start to destroy the empire because we're not happy with all the glorious success we're not happy with that anymore we, we're bored we're bored so we want to destroy so it's time to start the destruction so we start the pillage we start the uh the burning the massacring yeah, it's, yeah, why not, you know? At the end of the day, um, life's about having fun. So this is how they decided to have fun back then. Destroying everything. Tyranny. Taxes. Control. And, oh, there we go, the savage state. Uh, we don't seem to have the, the, the final stage of the ruins. Okay, the savage state, that's the first state. And then, oh yeah, the ruins. The final stage. The ruins, and there's no people because the people too have been destroyed because they've left. They've gone elsewhere to other cities, to found new empires, to found new cities. So we just have the, the ruins, right? And that's what happened to Rome. So in the late empire, we started to have things called the Latifundium, which was basically, imagine a, um, a giant work camp, a uh, collective farm. Well, a collective farm than a work camp. And it's full of serfs. They're not necessarily slaves there. They can be serfs. And they just specify, they concentrate on one type of crop and they make a lot of money. But it, it's kind of like a... It's it's like a it's like a state owned collective farm because lots of individual farmers were pushed out of business. So the state started owning everything. Every industry became a state industry over time. And the emperor went from just owning Egypt to owning almost the, a, a lot more of the empire, a state farm. And we saw what happened with the art. We went from a sort of free market system where Anyone who was talented, who had a passion, could create, could live their passion and create something really beautiful, uh, such as this, uh, I believe it's Marius of the late Republican period. Uh, again, um, an amazing, an amazing artwork. It, it just captures not only uh, the appearance, but the personality. And it shows that the wrinkles are, they're earned. These are earned wrinkles. So he wants to, to show, show the wisdom this is a picture of wisdom, right? And then, after Diocletian started... Uh, and firstly, the 3rd century was a disaster. There were 60 emperors or more. Endless civil war. And Diocletian, in around 300, said, I have to clamp down, or there's going to be more war. I have to control every aspect of what Romans do, think, hear, and say. 
And from now on, no one's allowed to do what they want anymore. They're going to do what I say. They're going to inherit the jobs of their fathers. Everything's going to be inherited from now on. So serfdom begins. And we start seeing uh, the Tetrarchs. They were around the time of Diocletian as well. I believe just after Diocletian, um, the Tetrarchy. It looks to me like they're looking um, towards the four corners of the empire, or two corners, or one corner, I'm not sure. Um, and they all have the same face because they're all equals, but what a weird looking face. And you can see straight away that although this is a late Roman style, the archaeologists concentrate on that only, and they say, okay, this is this was a new style. They also say, well, maybe, the, why did the quality go down? Well, they don't really know, because they're not allowed to say, because I believe it's unfashionable in the universities to say that... Um, Socialism doesn't produce the greatest works of art. Uh, it, it can, if someone's passionate, but if they're not passionate, if they're forced to work, if they're forced to do this, someone was forced, someone may have been forced to make this against their will. They may have wanted to be a farmer, but someone was forced to do this. Sure, they did it for money, they were happy enough, but they weren't that good at it. Compare that to Cato. Now, some of the Diocletian heads are good, some of them are not so good. I reckon you or me could, could do something like this. This was someone who was forced. This isn't like what we saw before. So, there is one paper, um, How Excessive Government Killed Ancient Rome. <laughs> and it's it's one of the only pa papers you'll see. And it's not found in a, a normal journal. It's, um, it's, it's on the Cato Institute. We just looked at Cato. But another Cato, the Cato Institute, they're libertarians. Bruce Bartlett. This is from the early 80s, I believe. And I'm just going to read aloud and, and then add, add some comments, just a few paragraphs, and then we'll look further at what really happened. And what actually happened was, during the 3rd century, there was massive inflation. Cassio Dias wrote that after Marcus Aurelius, everything that was gold turned to rusty iron. And the money literally did that, because it became absolutely devalued. They took all the silver out of it. And money actually became worthless. And because money was worthless, the, the soldiers went bankrupt. The soldiers were responsible for their own food. There was no, um, there was no, um, there was no uh, catering corps, and they couldn't buy any food because the money was worthless. So you have a, a system where the empire no longer has the facilities to maintain what it has. Action was required, and Diocletian imposed cr price controls to protect the soldiers, and it made this made him popular with the army. He stayed in power. So, but what happened was this. It was a kind of domesday book. This required a massive census, not only of people, but of resources, especially cultivated land. Land was graded according to its productivity. Fields were measured out clod by clod. Vines and trees were counted. Every kind of animal was registered and note taken of every member of the population. Can you imagine how many bureaucrats you have to pay to do this? This is called... Socialism. This is why the Soviet Union collapsed. Taxable capacity was measured in terms of the kaput, that's the head, which stood for a single man, his family and land and what they could produce. The state's needs were measured in terms of the anona, which represented the cost of maintaining a single soldier for a year. With the two measures calculated in precision, it was now possible to have a real budget and tax system based entirely on actual goods and services. So Diocletian thought, oh, I'm going to work it all out. I've got it all worked out. This is going to be brilliant. This is going to be great. Assessments were made and resources collected, transported and stored for state use. Although an army on the move might still requisition goods or services when needed, the overall result of Diocletian's reform was generally positive. Taxpayers at least knew in advance what they were required to pay rather than suffer the ad hoc confiscations. Also, the tax burden was spread more widely instead of simply falling on the unlucky and thus lowering the burden on many Romans. At the same time, with improved availability of resources, the state could now better plan and conduct its military operations. Okay, uh, okay. But in order to maintain this system where people were tied to their land, homes, jobs, and places of uh, people, the people were tied. They were tied to their land, home, jobs, and places of employment because then it goes out of whack. Diocletian transformed the previous ad hoc practice. Workers were organized into guilds and businesses into corporations called collegia, colleges. Both became de facto organs of the state, controlling and directing their members to work and produce for the state. So you get a fixed money, the state owns the business. And it was very hard for individual businesses to survive. And, and we actually noticed that the, number, the amount of shipping collapses. Constantine continued this, made it worse. 
in 332 the following order. Any person in, in whose possession a tenant that belongs to another is found. This is a tenant. This is not a slave. This is a tenant. Not only shall restore the aforesaid tenant to his place of origin, but shall assume the capitation tax for this man for the time he was with him. So firstly, do you see what's happening here? They made everyone a Roman citizen, not just the aristocracy, but everyone became a Roman citizen so they could tax them. And then they enslaved them all. So firstly, they diluted the importance of being a Roman citizen, and they diluted it so much that they said, okay, you're serfs now. <laughs> Tenants who, who mediate flight may be bound with chains and reduced to a servile condition so that by virtue of a servile, servile com, tom, condemnation, they shall be compelled to fulfill their duties that befit free men. Despite such efforts, land continued to be abandoned and trade for the most part ceased. This was a Soviet economy. What's the dif Seriously, what's the difference between it became a communist system? Industry moved to the provinces, basically leaving Rome as an economic empty shell, still in receipt of taxes, grain, that's from Egypt, we've discussed that, and other goods produced in the provinces, but producing nothing itself. The mob of Rome and the palace favourites produced nothing, yet continually demanded more, leading to an intolerable tax burden on the productive classes. Fifty years after Diocletian, the Roman tax burden doubled, making it impossible for small farmers to live on their production, this is what led to the final breakdown of the economy. The number of receipts began to exceed the number of contributions by so much that farmers' resources exhausted by the enormous size of the requisitions. Fields became, became deserted and cultivated land was turned to forest. And we see evidence of this. We see, we're going to get to that. We see evidence of it. He tried to restore the, current, the, the currency, but subsequently the empress continued to debase it, uh, causing price inflation. Less silver in each coin. Less silver, less silver, less silver. Julian, another one, um, the last of the pagans. Um, he knew this was happening. He couldn't really stop it. Everything was uh, falling apart. Uh, the re and the revenues of the state remained inadequate to maintain the national defense, leading to further tax increases. And we're going to see all the evidence of this. Uh, sales tax went up a lot. State revenues continued to shrink. Taxpayers invested increasing amounts of time, effort, and money into tax evasion schemes. <laughs> this was terrible. But large, powerful landowners were able to avoid taxation through legal or illegal means. And we see the, the, the rise of the landowner. We see that in Roman Britain after the year 300. Small landowners were crushed into bankruptcy by a heavy burden of taxation, threw themselves on the mercy of large landowners, signing on as tenants or as slaves. And slaves paid no taxes. And Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, to summarize, in the end, there was no money left to pay the army, build forts or ships, protect the frontier. The barbarian invasions, which were the final blow to the Roman state in the 5th century, were simply the culmination of three centuries of deterioration in the physical capacity of the state to defend itself. Indeed, many Romans welcomed the barbarians as saviors from the tax burden, and that happened in eastern Rome. The Turks, when they went into, into Rome, uh, into Turkey, they, 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 they said, look, you have, firstly, you have religious freedom under us. Secondly, um, we'll bribe some of the aristocrats to join us and the generals. Thirdly, we're going to lower your taxes. So what have you got? To, and we're, we're still going to let you be Romans. What have you got to lose? And the Ottomans conquered so easily. They were so smart that the normal Byzantine rulers, they were just stuck in the past. They had no clue. The, the Turks, they really understood. Although the fall of Rome appears as a cataclysmic event in history, for the bulk of the Roman citizens, it had little impact on their way of life. And guys, we, we do you see what letters? We're using Roman letters. Our legal system is, has Roman words. The invaders didn't change too much. They became Roman, but they ran it better. In conclusion, the fall of Rome was fundamentally due to economic deterioration resulting from excessive taxation, inflation, and overregulation. Higher and higher taxes failed to raise additional revenues because wealthier taxpayers could evade such taxes while the middle class and its tax paying capacity were exterminated. Amazing. Amazing. So. Numismatic evidence. So um, there's a brilliant book on Roman Britain from 1980. I love it. It's called The Companion to Roman Britain by uh, Peter Clayton. I love it. 
And the, the numismatist who contributes to this work of, of literature says that, of, uh, not literature, it's, uh, it's evidence, it's, a, it's an essay, it's a chapter. He says that r the Roman Empire seems to have vanished from Britain in 300 AD and the cities were abandoned. What happened? And obviously the Edicts of Diocletian, everything I just described to you. So we, the archaeologists have found that the coastal cities began to fall into ruin and were transformed <laughs> into farming villas. So they, they saw that the, the townhouses in the late cities... They look like like country estate houses. The theatres began to be used as, as for housing pigs and rubbish tips, and all the cities fell into poverty. Life prospered in... Do you see how crushing the taxes must have been? Life prospered in regional villas, which transformed into feudal estates. Tax collectors could possibly be bribed by warlords, as, as that article suggested. And the villas uh, are prospered and they expanded. They, they had serfs and they, they, they collected serfs and they became rich. Instead of a swimming pool, they built an attached church with separate entrance, maybe to help control the people. While the Roman, uh, the Roman hordes, these are the hordes, uh, when we say that we don't mean the soldiers, we mean the, the treasure hordes. So we are told whenever we, they find money in Roman Britain, the coins, they, we are told, oh, the Romans left it and buried it to collect again when they returned after defeating the Germans, the Saxons. And they, th and they never did. Actually, what happened was this. We need to hide this from the tax man or all will be taken. Increase in hordes buried as the collapse approached. And they're taking money out of the system, less taxes. This reduced the money supply. And what happened? People like, lords pretended to be, to be commoners, literally, literally. This reduced the money supply. Diluted silver in the coinage, debasement, good money doesn't follow bad, they don't reintroduce it, causing reluctance to reintroduce coins into the deba debased money supply, it goes on and on, um, etc. And the wheel must, I'm saying the wheel must turn evenly, it must be evenly balanced, and taxes and unpredictable taxes can't help with that. So, collapse of Rome, the collapse of the system, easily or diffu Rome previously easily stopped the invasions for four centuries. Even when they were rich, rich they were really struggling to stop the Germans, but they did, but they couldn't any longer. So why aren't we taught this? Because I've only found this out recently, the communization of uh, late Rome. <laughs> Republican and Judeo Julio-Claudian aristocracies had a low tax, and this gave way to increasing taxes, needs to bribe army for power. The system began to dismantle itself from within. Murphy's Law, business cycle, whatever you want to call it, it ended up... And basically, I reckon, sabotage from Roman citizens joining the Germans. They said, we don't like this system, we'll join you. Rule over us, please. In pillaging the empire, starting up new kingdoms. Now, why aren't we taught this? Because I believe post-war socialism. In the 50s, the world turned to socialism, 50s to the 70s. And this meant that this sort of research could not be published. It was unpopular. Why? Because they thought, we, oh, our socialism is different. We can do better. Because we've got science this time. You know, We're planning to go to the moon. We're launching satellites. And we've got ENIAC, the computer ENIAC. So... You know, at the end of the day, there's nothing stopping us doing whatever we want, and we can have our socialism and eat it too. So, rise of Christianity. What's that? What's that all about? Well, why did the Romans, the, the emperors tried to suppress it so strongly, and the harder they tried, the more popular it became. And Gibbon really was against Christianity. He said this caused the fall of Rome. He said this caused the fall of Rome. This is what did it. Because and he came up with a strange explanation. He said, well, it sapped their moral fiber. It, um, it made them reluctant to fight anymore. But that's not true, because if you're only concentrating on the afterlife, as they did, you wouldn't care so much about the present life. So what's he on about? But I believe the concentration on the afterlife was due to the fact that they started to hate their present lives. They hated it. They didn't want to live anymore. They uh, Under that terrible, tyrannical system, they were miserable. Uh, my bro says, in physics, cause and effect is interchangeable. Did they think my next life is better? I hate my life. I hate my job. And there was a huge decline in the arts because you didn't need to be an artist anymore. And if you were not an artist, you couldn't become an artist. And obviously that caused some troubles uh, in the 20th century, didn't it? There was some fellow I recall in Germany. He, uh, he Is that true? He, was, uh, he might have been an artist or something like that. The Kaiser or something? I don't know. Anyway, there are hardly any economic historians. That's the other problem. As humanity's brains and numbers brains don't mix, but we do both on this channel. Universities attract revolutionaries as it's the ultimate non-blue collar job. They can't do blue collar because they're actually not built for it. And this is the only job they can do. Uh, 
firstly, they have a sufficiently overinflated ego, which needs requires excessive flattering. And then they have a, a birth defect, which is called the derangement of the ligament because they're not built for hard work. They actually can't do hard work. And many uh, white collar people are trapped this way. They're trapped. Um, I met many bankers when I was a, uh, I was working last year as a mortgage broker and um, which is why I didn't make many videos, but I know as many bankers that they're working 15 hours a day. They're exploited. They love it. They love the job, but they, um, it's all they can do <laughs> because of that. They work 15 hours a day. They never see their family just to make a decent income. So, um, many, uh, um, people, um, they can be manipulative because if they don't have it physically, they have it mentally, they use manipulation and abuse. And, um, many, and as a result, academic society is actually quite an abusive, toxic uh, world. I'd estimate maybe 50% are toxic and weird. 50% are geniuses. They're brilliant and they deserve to be there of academics. 50% nah, 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 nah. <laughs> And I've noticed recently, since about the 1970s, the university system actually disregards knowledge and they want structure, they want sophism. Too many, there's too many taboo knowledges these days. You're not allowed to talk about certain things. And this started in the 20th century with, with uh, I believe, when they said long-range weather forecasting is banned. They were banning it. That's astrology. We're banning it. We're not even going to talk about it because now science is the god. Uh, traditional medicine is banned with the 20th century. I believe the 19th century was discredited when radioactive decay was discovered and Kelvin was discredited. Kelvin's astronomy was dis discredited. He said the sun was 20 million years old, 100 million years old. They, they discredited everything about the 19th century when they discovered radiation. And they started using radiation, radium pills and all this, and the 20th century, the future, and, you know. And, um, and, and, and this meant all the buildings were discredited. So in the 20s, they started demolishing all the Victorian buildings and replacing them with deco, futuristic curves. Now, where are we today? Taxes higher than ever and increasing. History doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Where are we heading, people? Where are we heading? Your comments below. Uh, do hope you've enjoyed the video.